Hi, I'm Gail Goodman, the CEO of Constant Contact. I also consider myself a founder CEO. Actually, Constant Contact was founded by Randy Parker and a small team in an attic right here in Brookline. But I joined them pre-product, pre-revenue, pre-funding. So for the purposes of this talk, I'm a founder CEO. I would also let you know that I'm a first time CEO, which basically means for the last 15 years, uh, I've been winging it. <laughs> but I've also been uh, radically defying the odds because we all know founders can't scale. Ask any venture capitalist and they'll tell you that founders rarely navigate that path from idea to scale venture. And what I mean by that is going from the time when there's you know, a small team, you know everybody, a set of projects and priorities that you actually have your arms around, to the time when there are people in the organization you don't know, projects that are getting kicked off that you're completely unaware of, and maybe even a lot of them. Founders rarely make that path, and the data completely supports this. So by three years in, only 50% of startups are still run by their founder. Another year later, it's down to 40%. And by the time a startup, if they ever get there, gets to an initial public offering, it's down to 25% of founders running the business. And yet you're all probably sitting here thinking of some iconic founders who made it all the way. Right, I don't even need to list the names. You probably have a few uh, in your head. So what did they do? Well, I'm sure they did a ton of things, but the reality is they had a formula that probably the rest of us can't emulate. <laughs> right, once in a generation brilliant. So what, uh, what do the mere mortals uh, uh, have to do to navigate this path. And my idea is simple, but incredibly hard. You need to face yourself. You need to hold up a mirror and you need to be ruthless about your own leadership trajectory. And so I'm talking about CEO, but this could easily be you're running a nonprofit, you're running a team, you're just an individual who wants to do better and create more change. The ability to look at yourself can be a critical change agent for helping you do better in, in whatever it is you're trying to achieve. The truth is you have to face yourself and you also have to face two really difficult facts. You are always doing something wrong and your personal flaws are harming the team. Ow. It's kind of harsh, huh? I put it in such stark terms because the very traits that most founders have, outward confidence, relentless optimism, an unwavering belief in your idea and your team are sometimes the very traits that make it super hard to hold up that mirror and to look inward. So let's dive in a little bit to these two ideas. So your business is growing and changing. The role of the CEO changes at least every six months, if not sooner. And in some ways, it's almost obvious, right? You're always doing something wrong because you could always be doing more of something, less of something else, right? We always have that guilty nagging, I should be doing more of X but it actually turns out you probably should be doing less of some things too. So let me share a story from the early days. So in the very early days of Constant Contact, um, it was all about figuring out what they call product market fit. Are we building the right features? Do we have the right target market? Do we have the pricing model right? And that really required me as the CEO to dive in deep with the product team. Well, it turns out I'm an ex-product manager, so that was very comfortable. And dive in I did. And 
And it was completely appropriate at that time because we had very little funding and these, pri these priorities and trade-offs we were making were the swing votes that were gonna make us you know, live or die. But then we started to get a rhythm. We built a strong team. They were iterating well. And guess what? I stayed over on the product side. It was comfortable. So one day, the VP of engineering invited me out to lunch because he had something he wanted to talk to me about. I completely assumed it was about him. And he sat me down and shared in the nicest possible way uh, that I was driving the team nuts. <laughs> and I believe his words were, you need to get out of our shorts. <sighs> and it was actually pretty hard to hear, but he was exactly right not just because of the impact I was having on his team, because the reality was we were starting to get a rhythm. And there were new things that needed my attention. We needed to figure out the sales and marketing problem. And so by staying in the old model and not moving to the new, I wasn't working on the most important things. And as a leader, where you spend your time is actually one of the most important investment decisions you make. It's easy to think it's, you know, who am I, you know, which people are we hiring and where are we spending our dollars? But where you are spending your time is also an important investment decision. And it's unbelievably easy to go to the urgent, to the interrupt, to the crisis. All right, sometimes you do need to go to the crisis. But it's unbelievably to, easy to not be mindful about where you're spending your time. So how do you step back from that day to day and get a little bit more thoughtful? And this is where the mirror comes in. So I've found a couple of ways to do this. One is through a peer mentoring group. So for the last 10 years, every quarter, I've spent a day to a day and a half with a set of peers looking at not just the business, but my role as a CEO and what I'm doing well or not well. One of the disciplines of this group is we actually start each session with where did you spend your time last quarter? Where do you hope to spend it next quarter? Forcing that thoughtful step back to see the forest for the trees because when you are in the firefight, you have no perspective. The second best practice is actually spending time offsite with my team. So we do regular twice a year, multi-day offsites. We didn't start there, we started with one day and half days, where we look at what's going right in the business, what's not going right in the business. And often that what's not going right is that roadmap to where you probably should be focusing a little more of your time, because sometimes the CEO is the one that needs to break through to drive the next level of change in an organization then it's not just about what you're doing. Let's get back to that other one. Your flaws are harming the team. It's about how you're doing it. So we all know we have strengths and weaknesses. I'll ask you to put your weakness in your head. Uh, but we also have strongly constructed rationalizations for why our weakness is actually also our strength. So let me just dive into one of mine. I am impatient and I don't hide it very well. All right, so if I were being really honest, I don't even try to hide it. <laughs> because when I push the team, it drives us to new levels, right? You hear the rationalization? My impatience is a strength. But it was also harming my team in some pretty profound ways. So one of the things I did along the way was I invented uh, my own little internal signal to presenters. Kind of went like this. You know, and it meant, I got it, I got it, go faster. And again, I had a little rationalization. It's affirming to them that I'm with them. <laughs> so, not obvious to you in the audience, that was not a pleasant thing to be on the receiver side of. And it was doing a bunch of things. So first, it was stunting discussion, right? As the presentation was going on, we weren't getting ideas and conversation happening in the room. Second, it was sending an immensely disrespectful signal to the presenter. Yeah, you did a lot of work, but it's not worth my time, right? I don't care enough to keep listening. Horrible. But then, the really bad part started to sink in. P 
people were not bringing their up and coming new talent to present to me because they didn't want them to get demoralized. These were the very people I wanted to meet and nurture. They were the future of the company and I wasn't meeting them. And so I had to change. I don't think anyone's gotten this in a while, although I was really tempted last week. <laughs> so how do you start to understand these things you're doing that are having impacts? This gets to my last point. Feedback is a gift. But in the gift-giving world, it's one of those we'd far rather give than receive, <laughs> right? And the more senior you get in an organization, the less, feed, the less unfiltered feedback you get. Because our society has taught us the last thing you want to do is criticize your boss to your boss, right? Very bad. So you, as a leader, need to make sure you're getting unfiltered feedback. And there's ways to do that. So we do a employee engagement survey, and it specifically asks for feedback on our leadership. But one of the ones that's worked extraordinarily well for me is the facilitator of those offsites I said we were doing goes around before each offsite and interviews the whole management team, of course, about the business and other things. But one of the questions she asks is, how is Gail doing as a leader? What would you like to share with her? And it's completely anonymous, trusted environment. The woman can probe so I can get real actionable insight. So the first time she uh, went through this exercise with me, she came in with like a list. <laughs> I was, it was unbelievably hard to hear. So I did what everybody does. I shot the messenger. <laughs> and then I got angry. I mean, really indignant. How could my team not understand why these kinds of behaviors were natural outcomes of all the tough things we had to be working on? And then I went home and cried. And then I brooded. And I mean brooded. <laughs> and then I brooded some more. And then I realized I had been given a gift and I wasn't accepting it. And that without this knowledge, there was no room for change. You cannot change what you don't know is a problem. And so I thank them if they listen to this. And I say to each of you, um, be thoughtful about how you lead. Hold up that mirror to yourself and your leadership. And defy the odds and show the world that founders can scale. Thank you.